Developed by Facebook in 2013, the moment it was released, React took the world by storm. With over 200,000 stars on GitHub, thousands of jobs, books, and even entire classes, it's arguably the most popular front-end library around today. So in this video, we're going to ask, how good was React actually? Our journey takes us on a deep dive into the history of the internet. We'll talk about the environment that made React necessary, other approaches people tried, and how React stacks up against its competition. We'll also talk about next generation libraries like Next.js to see if React can still hold its own against a new era of competition. Our story starts in 1989 with the man himself, Tim Brenners-Lee. In the late 80s, working at CERN, Tim decided he and his buddies needed a better way to share scientific information. It was basically just plain text with a little extra. Paragraphs and headers to make sense of long articles, images and tables to show charts and data, and its key feature, hypertext, basically just clickable links that connected the whole web of information together. At this point, I'd like to point out a few things about the design of HTML. This is a little foreshadowing of the demons we'll see later on. HTML was designed around text with links. Its emphasis was on displaying data and not as a general UI application. HTML is a data description and not a graphics engine. It describes the structure of the document, but then it's up to the browser to decide where to draw all of the pixels and ultimately what the website should look like for the user. Most HTML pages were static pieces of information, largely written out by hand. When you visited a web page, it usually meant that somebody wrote that HTML file by hand and then uploaded it to their server. But as you all know, people wanted more. In classic computer science fashion, people took something that worked pretty well and vagabonded it to do something entirely different. Wikis turned into job boards, forums, and suddenly full-fledged applications. As applications became more complicated and more dynamic, people needed more complex logic to keep their websites interesting. Initially, people focused on server-side logic. It went something like this. Instead of visiting a static web page, you would instead make a web request. Not just asking for the page itself, but providing parameters with additional information. In the 80s, every web page would just respond with some file sitting on the server. But in this new world, the server would generate the HTML for the web page on demand and then send that generated HTML back to the client. Because content was generated dynamically, instead of having websites with just a few pages, you could, at runtime, generate an infinite number of possibilities. What's more, you could add advanced logic since the templating code ran on your server in a real programming language. It had a few problems though. HTML is a string and the web pages get sent back and forth as HTML strings. That means if you wanted to respond to tell someone that the sky is blue, you have to generate in code a string that has the value inside of an HTML document. Now there are a million templating libraries and other tools for turning data values into HTML, but to this day, I've still seen production code that looks like this. Even though HTML has the structure of a tree, it's still usually represented as a string and building an HTML tree in a verbose language like Java is, well, not exactly aesthetically pleasing. People made all sorts of solutions for this, but in my opinion, none were particularly good. The most common were templating libraries that felt a little bit too much like string.format. You'd write some HTML code with the missing value, and then at runtime, you'd call it with something that plugs the values in the right places. Another truly unhinged approach was PHP, whose approach was to basically pretend HTML was a real programming language, and then butcher and mangle the syntax to turn it into a scripting language in the most disgusting way possible. Even though PHP the language is an absolute monstrosity, it was hugely popular and it's still in use today. I just want to emphasize how hard of a problem this was, that people were willing to use a language like PHP that was sort of unmaintainable because it made HTML templating a little bit easier. People wanted it because it was simple, in some sense, and it let them write all of the code for their web page in one file. People literally threw away the MVC architecture and 20 years of software design because they wanted to make web pages that look nice. 
Still, the internet was progressing at breakneck speed, and web developers still had problems. They wanted things that could move and shift, windows that were more interactive, and those little pop-up advertisements that flashed neon colors everywhere. People tried things like Adobe Flash, but as the web grew and people started to vaguely care about security, all eyes turned to JavaScript. As legend has it, JavaScript was invented in seven days and is an everlasting example of why it's important to build something quickly and ship it rather than be slow and methodical and try to design it well. Its developer wanted to make Lisp for the modern web, but middle management didn't like it. So he created a language with anonymous functions and C-like syntax, and he named it JavaScript so nobody would notice. JavaScript and Java actually have nothing to do with each other. Not even as a joke, they named it that way intentionally to confuse people because they wanted middle management to think it was just like Java. As bad as JavaScript was as a language, it was also bad at editing HTML. Editing an element in an HTML tree, literally the most common thing you'd want JavaScript to do, looks like this. It technically lets you edit any element on the page, but in the tradition of web developers wanting to type slightly less characters, people turn towards jQuery, a JavaScript library that made it slightly easier to get document elements and provided a few useful little utilities. Even still, the way people thought about JS was that HTML documents represented the content of the web page, and JavaScript were these little extra programs that could run and modify how the document looked. Now, there's a million different web frameworks and libraries out there, but I'd like to pause for a minute and look at the big picture. All of these frameworks were created because editing HTML is terrible. <laughs> HTML is sort of like a wiki language, but it was never meant to handle full-scale modern applications. In particular, it had an emphasis on text and data and not general purpose tools. It was designed as a data description rather than a graphics engine, so it was hard to get pages to look right in different environments. And importantly, it was designed for people writing HTML files by hand, and it was never designed to handle the programmatic adventures that people were using it for in the modern world. What's going on here is HTML isn't a programming language. It's missing key features that desktop application languages had, like types, objects, and inheritance. It can't even represent complex data structures, like hash sets, without doing some shenanigans where you serialize everything to a string and then parse it out at runtime. More and more, people were using tools outside of HTML to manage the structure of their website, but they still needed HTML itself to translate things into a language that everybody's browser would understand. What's worse, the browser had to parse and then re-render HTML every time it was changed, so the performance of actions that modified the UI was a real concern. To see why this makes things so difficult, let's try building a simple to-do list using HTML and JavaScript. You could store the list contents in HTML, but as your application grows or your list items become complex data types, you'll want to hold the set in a JavaScript variable to avoid repeated serialization. When somebody adds a new to-do to the list, you first need to add it to the JavaScript variable, that's your source of truth for the data, but then you also need to update the HTML to reflect the changes to the user. What's worse, if you want to delete an element from the list, you have to give every HTML tag an ID and then store those IDs in your data model so you can find the right element to remove. What's going on here is you want to model the state of your application using a real language like JavaScript, but you have to do all this extra work to keep track of the HTML so that you have a UI that can be understood by the browser. What's worse, you have to be very careful because anytime you parse or touch HTML, you can introduce performance concerns. So if you were going to replace HTML with something better, what would it have to look like? Well, you'd want the full power of a real programming language with objects, data types, the whole nine yards. You'd want the ability to easily grab information from the server or an external source and insert it into the application. And most importantly, it needs to work with existing browsers. So you'd need something that updates the HTML so that what the user sees stays in sync 
with whatever new data representation you just invented. Enter React.js. React's big idea was represent the data and all of the application logic in JavaScript, and then have a program that translates that data representation into HTML. Every time the underlying data representation changes, re-render the entire HTML, or at least just the parts that were affected, and show that new HTML into the browser. What's important here is this means you could truly use this new language and this new data representation instead of HTML, and React would handle all the messiness of keeping the decades-old spec up to date. That isn't the miracle of React, though. The miracle of React is that React was fast. Everybody thought React could never work because rendering the page every time a variable changed would be too slow to run in production. Boy, were they wrong. Not only was React fast enough, it was actually faster than many carefully optimized production systems. That's because React had some clever logic to reload HTML in only parts of the HTML tree that changed and its automated organization and optimizations were often more accurate than human ones. In 2013, when React was open sourced by Facebook, it truly took the world by storm. A production-ready, battle-tested framework that solved the HTML issues developers had been struggling with for years. Casual developers loved it because it was easy to use and it let them build websites that look nice with a little bit less boilerplate code. Serious engineers loved it because it was an ideological improvement on HTML and it was reasonably well thought out and well designed. And of course, middle management loved it because it was a safe choice that was used by Facebook and that everyone would congratulate them for. What I cannot stress enough here is that you need React or something like it if you wanna fix the problems with HTML. You have to do it this way. If you want to replace HTML with something that's backwards compatible, you need this kind of logic layer to keep everything in sync. There's no way to build this without some sort of syncing layer, and React is the cleanest and the simplest because it does it all automatically, without extra configuration or manual labor by the developer. Now, React did a lot of things well, but it also had some practical challenges. It was a front-end only framework, and while that kept things lightweight, it didn't capture all of the intricacies of client-server interaction. It also required that you render everything from JavaScript, which was a good thing for transforming everything out of HTML, but it required that you load the entire JavaScript file, execute it, and then render the page, all before the user even sees the beginnings of your website. It only affects first load time, but this is super important in a world where milliseconds matter, and an extra tiny little bit of load time could mean users clicking off your site. Lastly, it does still use JavaScript, which is, you know, JavaScript. So now we're going to explore some of the other libraries that came after to see how other tools picked up the slack where React fell short. The biggest and most popular one that I'd like to discuss is Next.js. Its main feature is that it preloads the first render and sends it back as HTML. So it evaluates the JavaScript first on the server and sends back both the first output alongside the code to update the page. It still works mostly the same way as React, but because it sends the HTML before the client has to run any JavaScript, the initial load time is way faster. The library I use, Reagent, runs as a layer on top of React, but instead of JavaScript, it uses a new language, Clojure, that you can compile into JavaScript so you get the advantage of a real language without ever having to deal with JavaScript directly. It's a little obscure, but absolutely awesome if you can cowboy your own development stack, and I made some pretty good tutorials for it right here on this channel. Last up is Angular, which isn't built on React, but is an entirely different approach to solving the same sorts of problems. Instead of emphasizing dynamic UIs and spicy, flashy applications, Angular is an enterprise-grade solution focused on testability, error checking, and consistency. It's good for building large applications with massive infrastructure around it, and while it hits some of the same notes, it focuses, in part, on an entirely different problem than what React is trying to solve. I honestly think Angular would have built on top of React if it had been released sooner, and I also think people will build libraries on top of React that make testing and enterprise development much easier.
Part of what makes React so special is it's a small library that only does one thing, but does it very well. And as a result, it's easier to build on top of and to use in combination with other components. Whereas Angular is tricky to use unless you live in that stack and have a massive heavy development process. So how good was React actually? In my opinion, React was one of the best to ever do it. It built on top of legacy existing infrastructure, solved the pain point with that infrastructure, and it did it so efficiently, you would barely notice there was another layer at all. Not only that, but it was the only way to do it. Anything else that fixes client-side HTML has to look like this or mangle the same ideas in some way. I cannot emphasize how rare it is to have exactly one mathematical solution to a problem and for the elegant solution to be battle-tested, production-ready, and so fast that you don't need to worry about it. Even though JavaScript itself has some rough edges and parts of React need some polish, it was the bridge that everything else could build on to do front-end development with a new model of the world. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one.